Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Donnelly. I'm the manager of webinars for IBM Systems Magazine. And on behalf of IBM Systems Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You may ask a question at any time during the event by entering it into the Q&A panel. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A panel to alert us, and someone will assist you. You may download a PDF version of the slide deck by clicking on the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources, and you'll find that on the left side of your screen. Know that you can download the deck right from the platform without being disconnected from the webinar. Today's webinar, Robotic Process Automation and CICS, is sponsored by HostBridge Technology. Our featured spe speaker today is Russ Tubner. Russ is CEO and co-founder of HostBridge Technology, and for over four decades, Russ has been solving difficult problems associated with integrating IBM mainframes with web, cloud, and mobile applications. He has a number of patents and innovations to his credit, including delivering JavaScript to the mainframe over 10 years ago. And so without further ado, Russ, I will turn the presentation over to you. Janine, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction and certainly appreciate uh, everyone taking their time today to join us. Um, I was gratified to see that the, uh, the number of people who signed up for this uh, was uh, quite large. And so thank you again for taking your time. Uh, just so everyone on the, on the call knows, we have participants in North America, South America, uh, Europe, um, and to some degree uh, even broader than that. So uh, it looks like we have a good group, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A uh, regarding RPA in the mainframe. First of all, let me just by way of introduction take one slide to kind of introduce ourselves. Um, many people know HostBridge kind of from our uh, core product line uh, being our JavaScript engine uh, that does run on the mainframe under Kix. And using that platform, we're able to create APIs to allow distributed applications of, of any kind to be able to interact with Kix-based applications. Uh, what we'll be talking about today as a topic, that is RPA in the mainframe, is tied to our use of uh, another product, more recent product, called HTAC. And then we do have some other kind of boutique products in our product line related to, for example, socket support for those large organizations who are doing a lot with uh, socket-based applications and a few others as well. They're all on our website. No need to belabor that today. <clears throat> Our customers, um, as you might imagine, uh, run the gamut, uh, but they certainly are in those areas and industries that have been using uh, to their benefit large IBM mainframes and Kix-based applications for, for a long time. We're also very proud to align ourselves with uh, our technology partners, uh, whether it's IBM or SyncSort or Splunk or Broadcom. Those are just some of our partners, but particularly some that are are relevant for today. Speaking of our agenda today, we're going to be talking about RPA, or Robotic Process Automation. And we're going to provide an overview of that. We're then going to talk about how, how organizations are beginning to see RPA impact their mainframe um, in, in unexpected and surprising ways, and some of them not good ways. We're then going to talk about uh, a tool uh, that we've developed to assess mainframe RPA impact, and then finally move into a discussion of optimization and remediation strategies uh, regarding RPA. We're going to start this with a poll. And so uh, on your screen, uh, coming up will actually be a poll. It'll, it'll at pose the question, what is the state of RPA adoption in your organization? So how, how broad is the use of robotic process automation? It doesn't matter whether or not you have a formal RPA platform or whether you are, are kind of achieving this sort of 
um, automation, using other techniques, we'd like to know whether it is you would consider it to be extensive, moderate, light, none, or whether you're just uncertain. So I'll just pause for a minute. And uh, Janine, as you gather that data, uh, I'll flip over here and watch the results come in. And then I think the final results will be shared with you on your screen. Yes, they will, Russ. And I'm going to give it just a couple more seconds. We are definitely getting the results rolling in, but I think that um, there should be a few more answers coming up here shortly. All right, Russ, what do you think? Should we launch that? Yeah, yeah, let's launch. I think that's, this doesn't surprise me in the least. Okay, here we go, launching those results to the audience. Great. Well, coming up on your screen will be a bar chart that indicates that uh, unknown or uncertain is clearly the big winner. And uh, that's, that does not surprise me in the least. The people who have probably gathered on this call are those who are affiliated uh, with more of the centralized IT mainframe functionality. And frankly, a lot of organizations, this sort of, of uh, these RPA, platforms kind of grow up in the end user communities and we'll highlight a story of a customer at the end of this presentation and we'll show you the impact of RPA on their mainframe. I think it's also instructive to note that extensive and moderate um, took at least one third and then light or none, none uh, filled in the gap. Um, every meeting uh, that I've been in uh, with customers over the past year, um, in one form or another, RPA tends to come up. However, they are just at the beginning of kind of the adoption cycle. Anyway, let's move ahead and uh, consider what is RPA. Because although we talk about RPA today as being a particular um, there, there are products, there are platforms out there, such as Automation Anywhere or UiPath or many others that are dedicated RPA platforms. Robotic process automation has been with us for quite some time and in many different forms. I mean, just think back. When we all first got installed our first IBM 3270 terminal emulator, and it had this cool capability to write a macro, what's the first thing we did? We wrote a little script in order to make logging in or moving from application to application just a little bit quicker. And that's an example of a, of a robotic process. Um, it just, it was benign, it caused no problem. But we might consider that maybe Stone Age uh, RPA compared to where we are today. In many organizations, uh, they also began to use um, different types of Excel macros and scripts to automate interaction with the mainframe so that then they could take subsets of data and be able to load it into a spreadsheet. That, uh, in fact, is a very prominent use case at the organization we will highlight in our case study a bit later. And then, of course, there's the uh, formal RPA platforms, what we call and what they tend to call RPA bots where a, a piece of orchestration logic can be codified. It might screen scrape to the mainframe, web scrape to some web applications, interact with some database servers, do some sort of an automated process in order to make, in order to um, enhance end user uh, business productivity. And usually many of those initiatives are involved with trying to uh, honestly reduce headcount somewhere in the organization. But here's, the, here's what's true when the mainframe is on the other end of, a, of an RPA bot. As it becomes more per pervasive, RPA activity can drive asymmetric increases in mainframe transaction volumes. And we'll see that illustrated very shortly. Now, Oftentimes, the way that these RPA platforms interact with legacy mainframe applications is via 3270 interfaces and the APIs that, those, um, that are very common. So for example, um, in the case study that we'll be looking at, 
the RPA platform um, is essentially interacting with terminal-oriented transactions, and it is using a Halopi style interface to be able to slice and dice those 3270 data streams and, in essence, screen scrape the mainframe application. Now, the RPA platform might also go hit you know, web-based applications or server-based applications and also mine or scrape bits of information off that particular UI. So, uh, and, but RPA bots are typically used to be able to kind of go against those sorts of human interfaces, whether they're on the mainframe or not. Now, we're a, we believe that in the big picture, RPA platforms are great. I mean, we're going to show you some of the implications, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, of RPA platforms. But we, I don't want there to be any doubt that we clearly see that these RPA platforms can be really great tools inside the organization. However, when you use an RPA platform and you're going to use it to automate actions on the mainframe, you need to be very, very careful and cautious and make sure that you're achieving that access in the most efficient way possible. So we would, we would tend to say, based upon when uh, our experience, and that is when RPA platforms or uh, RPA activities of any kind, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet running on a client or a bot running on a platform, whenever it is screen scraping uh, mainframe or kickspace transactions, uh, three things seem to be true. Efficiency goes down, latency goes up, and as a result, cost goes up. Not just hard cost, but actually impact to the end user. We believe that this approach is completely insensitive to the mainframe application architecture, and sadly, it often means that RPA uh, work processes are, are, and transactions are run in the least efficient way possible. And we're going to give you an, an idea of what that really looks like uh, using a real life uh, example with a customer. Uh, in fact, that particular customer case study started out with a phone call calling me and saying, uh, we would really like for you to take a look at what's going on on the interior side of our Kix uh, application environment. Our business volume is going up, but as our business volume goes up, uh, both our transaction volume is going up asymmetrically, as well as the mainframe cycles devoted to that particular business model, uh, volume. And in fact, that's one of the un unintended consequences that RPA can have on your mainframe. So we kind of net it out like this. Um, RPA platforms are good. Users can use these platforms to self-solve data access problems, and definitely it can create and enhance end user productivity. But when RPA uses screen scraping to access mainframe data, we begin to start to see the bad, see the bad side of this. And as you'll see on some of our analytics uh, in, a, in a few moments, uh, la the latency buildup not only uh, affects end user um, uh, response time, but also other things vying for resources on the mainframe. And last, you know, one of the things that's really problematic is the fact that most organizations simply have no visibility into the impact that RPA is making on their kicks or mainframe environment. Now, as you will see from some of the analytics screens or dashboards I'll show you, it can also get quite ugly. And that is that uh, RPA, uh, unconstrained RPA activity screen scraping against the mainframe can become operationally expensive and clearly inefficient. It can also jeopardize SLA attainment, not only for the direct activities, but for the activities that RPA-driven um, workload can impact. And to us, as, 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 as a vendor in this space for a long, long time, we think the biggest problem is what we refer to as application rigor mortis. And that is when the binding relationship between a mainframe based or kicks based transactions and applications and anything out the, outside the mainframe, when the binding relationship between those two components are essentially the format of a screen, 
what happens is that everyone is scared to death to change that application because if they do, the chances are about 95% that the integration will break. So a state of application rigor mortis sets in, and as a result, the perception of the value of the mainframe and those applications then becomes jeopardized. Bottom line, RPA is a great technology, uh, and it can deliver significant benefits to the enterprise, and we fully support it and encourage its use. However, the way RPA inter typically interacts with mainframes tends to be inefficient and can unnecessarily increase costs. That's what we've seen. Now, I'm going to turn a corner here, and we're going to begin to talk about the approach that we've taken to help large organizations assess the impact of RPA on the mainframe. And it kind of is formed around three tools. The first are SMF 110 records. Um, a 110 record doc is cut typically to document every transaction running in your system. And that SMF 110 record contains more than enough information, usually, for us to be able to do some basic RPA analysis. Also, our product, HostBridge uh, Transaction Analytics Connector, or what we call HTAC, is a component that runs on your mainframe under the covers of kicks that can allow us to extract bits of data and or metadata about each transaction run and cause that information to be included in the SMF 110 record as additional origin data. And then finally, we'll be using Splunk plus our uh, RPA assessment package, uh, which is a set of analytic tools and dashboards that run uh, in a Splunk environment to be able to look at the data and, and see what the data tells us. Um, we believe, as, as I'm moving or uh, preparing to show you these slides, let me just say that we believe that what we're trying to create for our customers is a process uh, where they first analyze the impact of RPA. Maybe it's big, maybe it's not. Who knows until you look. But we want to be able to quantify how is RPA impacting the mainframe and then specifically, if it is, we want to figure out where should we focus our remediation and modernization efforts. And in that area of optimization, we, it's kind of a two-step process. First of all, if terminal-oriented Kix applications are part of the RPA automation, or if bots are driving those, um, those, those transactions, then we would certainly encourage you to create APIs for access to those KICS applications, not um, terminal-oriented screen scraping under the covers. Obviously, we offer a, a product that can do that, so, uh, which is HBJS, which can do this sort of automation under the covers of KICS. Um, but that's not to say that's the only way to solve this particular problem. Then, once the APIs are created, then we want the RPA bots to interact with the mainframe via the APIs. And that's the good news, because while it might be easy or just obvious to cause a bot or have a bot screen scrape against the mainframe, all RPA platforms that I'm aware of fully support the idea of using an API to interact with an endpoint in order to extract data or run a bit of logic. Step two, then we would also do a supplemental analysis of that and figure out other APIs that should really provide that data. And it might be as simple as looking at a particular use case of an RPA, and instead of having the RPA go against a set of terminal-oriented transactions, maybe it should call a sequence of common area programs. Uh, maybe it should go directly against data uh, that has been staged in an operational data store. Well, anyway, you'll get the idea as we go through. So here's the actual case study. We're going to walk through six dashboards uh, in this analysis, and all the data that we'll be focused on came from a real customer. They are, they are a customer of ours, and, uh, and this, so this data came from, that we're going to be looking at, came from a 
two to four hour period. We started with about four hours of SMF 110 data from one uh, being driven two kicks um, around the um, from one particular country group in North America. I probably can't say anything more than that. The first step was to look at kind of a basic think time analysis. Because if we really want to know what's robotic, what's being driven at robotic speed versus human speed, the first thing we want to do is kind of gauge, OK, um, let's look at sequences of transactions and analyze think time. As you can see here from this slide, um, we, we ended up with a set of about a quarter of a million uh, SMF 110 records that gave us sufficient data to be able to see some good use cases. And as you can see, about 75% of all transactions had think times less than one second. Now just think about that. Already, if we just know that, that think time is less than one second for 75% of all transactions, uh, and, and when I say that, all transactions, that means Trans the same logical unit for the same thing emulating a terminal going from transaction A, B, C, and D. Well, we'd say the inter-transaction think time for 75% of their transactions was less than one second. We already knew something might be up. We then began through our analytical tools, our, yeah, analysis tools, we, we have the ability to uh, deduce and, and construct our, what we call RPA chains. These are the sequences of transaction activity that we can, we can completely and with high confidence be able to infer that this is some sort of a robotic activity. And so in this particular dashboard, you can set the, uh, the think time factor. So we set it looks like it's at 0.5. And then we began to say, OK, let's look at the size of these chains. Now, clearly, there are some that are very small, two, three, and four. Forget those. That's not what you want to be focused on. We want to be looking at the center of this graph or to the right. So look right in the center. There were, uh, what does it say, about 1,600 uh, that fell in at 11 to 20, and there was one that even exceeded 5,000 transactions. We'll zoom in on that in a minute. The other thing we wanted to do was kind of zoom out and say, okay, how much of this is going on? In fact, that's what this customer asked me. I mean, I need a dashboard to see what's happening. And so uh, this is it. So out of that quarter of a million transactions, uh, we were able to see that 216,000 were clearly driven by some sort of an RPA um, engine or activity. And they represented about 38,000 total RPAs or RPA chains. And given the graph at the lower part of the screen, clearly you can tell that the, that the bots are winning. Uh, human activity is, is percolating along there against these terminal-oriented transactions at a fairly predictable pace. But the bot activity is going off the chart. So uh, when the customer originally saw this, they, they began to suspect, yep, I think we have a problem. We then did some further analysis because their next question was, where is this coming from? And so we began to do some other um, analysis. And thank goodness we have a, a platform like Splunk where all this data is down there and we can begin to look at it. And sure enough, uh, we were able to isolate, we can isolate both the endpoints um, as well as the, uh, the users, some of the users uh, that are actually uh, causing this to occur. Now I circled two particular areas in, in both of those on that screen. That happens to be isolating the same server. And in fact, when we looked into their network, the load being driven from that purple segment of the pie chart was a, um, an RPA server. That was a server running continuously a sequence of bots that were hitting a whole collection of mainframe applications or mainframe transactions to be able to then uh, see uh, or to be able to drive that workload. Um, so it wasn't a figment of the imagination. 
of the customer's imagination that their mainframe was getting pounded. Um, and But this was their first glimpse as to why. Now, there's a logical question that flows from this. And, and I remember the day where the customer looked at me and said, what in the world are they doing? And so we went back and thought about that and said, well, what we need to figure out for a customer is to be able to produce, let's call it a DNA analysis. So we, we want to produce an RPA bot DNA analysis. And you can see this. So we, we entered a couple of basic parameters here. Again, think time. We can bias the, uh, the minimum transactions to be included and the maximum, and we can focus on particular uh, network endpoints if we want. By the way, all this data has been anonymized. Uh, so these uh, transaction names, uh, most of them have been anonymized. But you can see very clearly kind of what's going on here. And that is that they have in one case, they have an RPA, a bot, that ran the, the, the longest running bot, ran 6,746 transactions. It took 600 seconds, 10 minutes. It ran at a sustained kind of an average transaction rate of 11 per second. It consumed 14 seconds CPU time. And here's what it did. It ran the menu transaction once, and it ran a transaction called CTLG 6,745 times. Now, we created this RPA analysis so that obviously customers can see what's going on under the covers, kind of in these logical chains of activity. But also, we want to be able to create a dashboard so a subject matter expert can look at that and say, oh, I know exactly what they're doing. And sure enough, when we showed this to the customer and their SME on this application, they said, oh, yeah, we, we, we know exactly what they're doing. They are screen scraping a, um, a component catalog to be able to create a subset of that catalog uh, for them to use probably uh, at the beginning of their work day. So someone out with the best of intentions, use the RPA platform to mine a bunch of data, arguably in the least efficient way possible on the back end, in order to kind of give them a running start for their day's activities uh, doing their business function. You can see others here as well. So what we see in this uh, DNA analysis are, uh, first of all, in the RPA stats column, we list the transactions in alphabetical order. And then in the RPA DNA, that's actually the execution sequence. So in the second line item, you see that a bot uh, ran the order transaction uh, 981 times, then went to the menu transaction, and then hit the pricing uh, transaction uh, over 3,000 times. We obviously also um, do the computations on CPU time, and it turned out that when we, when we just clicked on that column to see how much CPU time was consumed, we know that this one, in fact, was the big winner. It took 15 seconds of CPU time. Um, it took 10 minutes and uh, involved the order transaction, the menu, and the pricing transaction. Now, um, it, we, as we dialogued with the customer, it became very clear that not only was this horrendously inefficient, that this data could be made available in other ways. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we also, by sorting on RPS, we wanted to find out from a volume or a speed standpoint who's the, what was the big winner. And there, is, uh, there were some bots out there that were running at a sustained rate of about 27 transactions per second. And you can see the inventory of everything they were doing on the system. The other thing we wanted to figure out, once we saw that, the customer asked the question, well, what transactions are kind of tangled up in these bot-driven activities? And so we went back to the drawing board and created what we call a, kind of a DNA frequency analysis. How often is the CTLG transaction uh, tangled up in these sorts of business processes driven by a bot? Here's the answer. Uh, clearly, there are some that are just beating the CTLG transaction to death. Uh, but then there are others that are, you know, maybe they're going to a menu transaction, 
running the CTLG transaction a few times and then oscillating back and forth. Again, our job is to be able to create a microscope for you to see this data and then so that you then have all the data you need to be able to come up with um, an efficiency project, a remediation project, anything that can um, help optimize your application environment. Speaking of optimization and remediation, let's talk about that. Because um, the first thing that I recommended when I saw this chart, let me go back to it. First thing we said when we saw this chart was we said, well, if you're going to run the menu transaction, if you really need to run menu and then run CTLG almost 7,000 times, the least efficient way to orchestrate that activity would be to orchestrate it from outside the mainframe. If you're really going to do it, you ought to orchestrate it on the interior side of the mainframe so that instead of having almost 7,000 requests and responses flowing to and from a workstation or the RPA server, you ought to send one request in, have the automation run on the mainframe, and then send one response back. And that's kind of what this diagram envisions, that there would be one interaction, perhaps, to the bot, the RPA platform. That bot, to get to the mainframe, really only needs to make a single API call. And let's just imagine, for the sake of argument, um, our process automation engine happens to be running there, and then it could then do that orchestration at microsecond speed on the mainframe and then return a single document. So in other words, we want to do data retrieval via an API, not screen scraping, because when we're interacting with that terminal-oriented transaction under the covers of kicks, no screen scraping occurs. Uh, there are also other solutions because, and I'll go back and tell the story. I, I was having this dialogue with the customer, and they said, "Well, yes, Russ, that is certainly a way we could solve that problem, but it could actually be much simpler." And I said, "How's that?" And they said, "All we need to do is run a nightly batch job and take this catalog data that is required by this particular country group, stage it to our operational data store." as either an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF or some sort of a data format that is agreed upon, and they can come in every morning and without running 7,000 transactions times the number of workstations who are running this, they can just simply go to the ODS, pick up that file, and they're done. And so that's in fact what they've done. This DNA analysis has begun to surface end user requirements or help the IT uh, the mainframe apps folks be able to see what people are doing with these applications so that they have a better idea of how to really meet their data requirements. Because up to this point in time, no end user had called them and said, we need that data. They had just self-solved the problem, first using an Excel spreadsheet and then using an RPA platform. So our take on this from an optimization standpoint as we eliminate screen scraping, as we eliminate all these interactions between RPA bots and the mainframe, what happens? Efficiency goes up, latency goes down, the cost goes down, and we think most importantly, we can circumvent this application rigor mortis. Because at this point, since we're communicating between either the workstation or the RPA platform and the mainframe across an API call, there is no entanglement between the mainframe transaction screens and those types of artifacts and the distributed components like an RPA bot. I think we've probably covered this, but I'll just say that just to hit it again, API access versus screen scraping, greater efficiency and better performance, far better architecture, far lower cost, application functionality can evolve normally. Finally, people can 
begin to enhance and improve some of those mainframe applications that they've been scared to because of everything that breaks if, in fact, they did. And all of this can be transparent to the end users because it's cast over an API. So let's begin to wrap up and move into a Q&A period. Um, as, and here are three statements that we think kind of say it in a nutshell. As mainframe RPA activity scales, you can clearly have a negative impact on your, your mainframe environment. This, expense, this impact, however, can be expensive, and certainly in the customer's case that we highlighted is expensive, and it's largely not well understood. This was a customer that had really good mainframe tools. They could see that the CTLG transaction volume was high. They knew that. But they didn't understand, what they couldn't see was, was how that volume fit logically uh, into either what that end user was doing or how that transaction was being orchestrated by an RPA bot. And obviously, uh, through this presentation, we've highlighted tools and services and solutions that we have to, for you, to help you measure the impact and optimize, hopefully, the way RPA interacts with your mainframe applications. There are a couple of resources. Um, first of all, you can download a free guide that's on our website. I believe that link on your screen should be active. You can click on that right now and get, get to a page that will get you to that guide. Um, Call us. Call us and talk to us. We would love to set up um, an analysis for you, learn more about your particular uh, issues. So you can always reach us at info at hostbridge.com. Um, and so finally, uh, we'd like to get to some questions. So Janine, I think I'll take a drink of water real quickly, and then let's move into our Q&A period. Okay, Russ, sounds good. Here's the first question. Um, how long does it take to complete this mainframe RPA analysis, and what's involved in the process? Good question. First of all, let me uh, just confirm that there's really no, absolutely no work on your part. Uh, this particular customer that we highlighted uh, to kickstart this process, I asked them to provide four hours of SMF data. Uh, in retrospect, we could have looked for two only. Um, and we, in fact, provided them um, the parameters necessary to kind of cull down their SMF data on their system before they zipped it up and, and sent it to us. So they, it was, there's, there was no work. There's no work on your part. Uh, once we receive that SMF data, then we will schedule a time for us to do the analysis. Once you're on the schedule, let's say it would take probably two to three days to get back in touch with you and schedule a, uh, a conference call. Uh, to review initial findings. Okay. Um, you clearly are suggesting that screen scraping is a bad approach for RPA bots to get mainframe data. Will RPA vendors or those who use their solutions have to do significant reengineering to get data in the way you're suggesting? And then a little bit more, what's the degree of difficulty? Uh, that's a that's a very good and insightful question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all um, the RPA the RPA platforms that I'm aware of, and we've seen a few now, all of them have the ability to send an HTTP request to a an API endpoint. And in fact, it's really really simple to do that. Um, it's simpler than trying to walk through a whole sequence of screens and screen scrape. So when the bot comes to that particular business step in the business process, then instead of going into orchestration mode where it's trying to you know, dialogue with the mainframe and send in these keystrokes and get back the screen and scrape that, it just simply sends an API request. So it's very simple. This mode of invocation of mainframe APIs is fully supported by all RPA vendors that I'm aware of. And I just throw on one other comment in this question of how hard is it or what happens to change or what needs to change. The other thing that's true is let's imagine that the RPA today is running tens, hundreds, or heaven forbid, thousands of transactions. 
and you choose to use a mainframe or a Kix-based orchestration prod product like ours. Implementing our solution to provide an API or expose an API to your RPA platform, that too does not require any change to your existing CICS applications. So all of this can be done with full transparency, very simply, um, fully supported on both your RPA platform as well as requiring no change to your existing CICS apps. Great. Okay, here we go. I have designed a bot using UiPath to launch Web 3270 mainframe terminal. It will read Excel sheet and update data in 66 kick screen. How is your API better than that? Oh, well, I hope we've uh, covered that by now. What, what is happening with your API is, or with, with that particular bot, is you're firing up that bot, it's going to be sitting there running on UiPath, and then you're going to be driving individual transactions. So every time you send an, a, a transaction request, so what, 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 our, what the UiPath tooling is doing under the covers is it's actually working a Holopi style interface. So under the covers, what UiPath is doing is simulating keystrokes going into kicks, and then those keystrokes are invoking that application. Then that application comes down, and you or someone has instructed UiPath to scrape or extract the various fields of information from that screen. Then on the basis of that, maybe you're going to press PF8 and go to the next screen, get the response, scrape some more. I'd mention two things. One is each one of those represents a full travel across your network, thus requiring the, the, the full and complete latency, whatever it is, between the UiPath server and the mainframe. And it requires all of those discrete interactions with CICS. Secondly, the UiPath bot is now aware, it's entangled with the format of those Kix screens. And notwithstanding uh, what many of the RPA vendors say, if you change the format of that screen, in some cases, even a little, like shift everything or, or expand the width of columns so that you can maybe handle larger city, city names or, you know, longer zip codes instead of just five digits. If that causes the screen format to change, it can easily, and with great predictability, break the integration. When we, however, when you use a product like HostBridge running on the mainframe, when we interact with that exact same transaction, the 3270 data stream is never generated for input or output. Because one of the things that we've kind of forgotten is that a lot of these CICS applications, they think better than we ever gave them credit. They don't necessarily talk in 3270 data streams. They think in terms of usually field name value pairs. And so, uh, the, so since we can interact with those mainframe apps on the basis of field name value pairs, then everything on the screen can change and the integration won't break. So those are two of the advantages I would highlight. Okay, next question. Are APIs provided by a product from HostBridge or is there customer coding required? Uh, it's a product, well, you can do it either way. IBM has some tooling built into Kix, and you are more than, well, you can certainly write your own, let's say, a COBOL program to implement an API on Kix. So you can do this yourself. Now, uh, we, we do, pr our, our product, HBJS, uh, is, we think, a far more flexible and easy approach. Our product runs on the mainframe, under the covers of Kix, completely zip enabled, so it doesn't drive up your uh, mainframe cost profile. 
And we will then expose an API, and then we are the we are the fulfillment side of that API. So then using our product, you would create, you would author, or we would guide you in authoring a bit of JavaScript that would simply orchestrate what you need to have happen on the interior side of the mainframe. So maybe it is run transaction A, B, C. Maybe it's even run transaction still 100 times. But because we're doing it on the interior side of the mainframe, we have no latency, and we're able to do it without screen scraping. Many of our customers will orchestrate transactions. They might then access DB2 or vSAM data, and then they might even invoke a comm area program. And all of that data and or business functionality is made available across a single API call. Okay, how about this one? Once you identify the issues, how do you remediate them, and how much of an effort is that? Well, it, it, it depends. Uh, so if we go, let me go back to a couple of these. It, it kind of depends on the, the circumstance. Like, let's look at this particular chart here. Um, if, if when I'm standing, uh, let's say I'm on the phone with you and I see a use case like this where it's just really, really simple, right? They're running a menu transaction one time and they're running CTLG almost 7,000 times or some variable number of times based upon the data that happens, you know, the, the data. Well, th this we would know kind of immediately how to remediate this or we'd know what our options are. But look below that, three down. And that is, look at the third one on that screen. It is a much more complex pattern or use case, right? I mean, they're going, uh, and I'm not, uh, it, it, it was unclear to me at first glance what was happening here, but th this is a very sophisticated bot that is running a whole series of orders in order to check status on behalf of particular customers. So this was a bot or, that's, or a spreadsheet that someone created to be able to do some really sophisticated work. Now, when I look at this, uh, it's not immediately obvious what, what needs to occur. So, so I think if, if you're on the mainframe side, if you were looking at this as an architect, you would say, okay, this this needs a conversation. We need to talk to this end user and, and make sure we understand their business objectives. I mean, surely there's an easier way, a more efficient way than running 3,000 transactions to be able to yield the business data that they want. Now, uh, we've seen use cases that, for example, um, not, not at this customer, but there was another customer where they, where they were running hundreds of transactions. And after we showed that to the customer, the customer was somewhat embarrassed because they already created a report with the exact same data. And even if the customer thought that the data on the report was stale and they wanted to get a real-time feed, they could have simply done a handful of DB2 calls uh, to get it more directly and far more cost-effectively than running hundreds of transactions. So, you know, the remediation strategy varies. I mean, if it's terminal-oriented transactions um, and that's the only way to get to the data, then uh, products like HBJS may, may play into your remediation strategy. Um, but uh, maybe not. You know, if you look at some of these and you realize, well, this is a, um, a use case for teeing up data to an operational data store, then that would be the correct remediation strategy. So it really, uh, I can, or we can, can give you the microscope, we can show you what's going on, but then um, you and your subject matter experts uh, regarding the applications are going to have to, um, you know, finesse it, are going to have to look at it. With, with your knowledge and understanding of the applications to, to derive the correct remediation strategy. Okay, Russ, while we're on this chart, I'm gonna to jump to this question. So is performing the mainframe RPA analysis the only way we'll understand the impact 
of RPA activity on our host? Are there other indicators that could be telling us our main famous mainframe is processing significant work coming from RPA? Well, um, like this customer, they had a they had a tool, um, and since since a lot of people have it, I'll mention it. They had SysView, and using SysView, they could easily tell uh, kind of the symptoms. They could tell that wow, there were a lot of transaction spikes that were occurring on the CTLG transaction uh, somewhere between 8:30 and 10:30 every morning coming out of a particular country. What's up with that? So they could see the symptom, but they couldn't see the root cause. They didn't they could not connect a symptom to the to the real reason, the business reason out in the field as to why this symptom was occurring. So um, you know, I we we built this because we didn't find or couldn't find a similar tool to be able to actually make sense out of these sorts of this sort of data so that you can really understand why why this is occurring what is the root cause okay great oh man Thank you so much, everyone, for all your questions. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up at this point. Um, I do want to thank everyone for attending, and I especially want to thank you, Russ. Such a great webinar. Thanks for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. And then um, I'd like to remind all our attendees that we will be sending out a follow-up email. Um, it will contain a link to the recording of today's webinar. Um, we're going to go ahead and also include the link to the free guide on understanding the impact of RPA on the mainframe. So please watch for that. Um, otherwise, that concludes our webinar. Thanks again, and have a great day.